Hi everyone, John here. Uh, back with, uh, well, another week, another book review. And the book I wanted to talk about this week was, um, as I'll mention at the end of the review, uh, a book by I uh, someone who I've read an, another book by and also posted about on my channel. And I'll, I'll tell you about the book in a little bit. Um, this one is, is a different one. It's called Evolution as a Religion by, I guess it doesn't say your first name on the front, but it's it's Mary Midgley, the famous uh, British philosopher, and I guess you could say mostly philosopher of science, uh, for the most part. This book certainly is a sort of a cross between um, culture, uh, religion, and uh, science, and the concerns that maybe overlap with all three of those. So for at least a century uh, in the United States, I think we can probably go back to the Scope trial, um, Scope's trial in uh, around 1925. We had this compatibility of science and religion uh, that seems to keep popping up as sort of a perennial qu question demanding our renewed attention every once in a while. And prevalent among pretty much all non-scientists, and even, it seems, a lot of scientists, maybe even the vast majority of scientists, is this rather naive idea about science that it's an objective set of facts that have come about through a purely positivistic, distanced, objective, empirical search for knowledge about the universe. With this view comes its corollaries, like the idea that science is an activity which is totally divorced from other stories or mythologies that we tell about ourselves, and again is wholly objective and cut off from uh, assumptions that we make about human nature. In this book, Evolution as a Religion, Mary Midgley, who is, if you're familiar with the history of her work, has always proven herself to be a bit of an ideological shit stirrer when it comes to the sacred cows of science, waits to uh, want to argue that science is actually much more complicated than this more simple picture would suggest. Rather than being an objective pursuit apart from human interests, many forms of science actually show themselves to be closely tied up with grander stories that we tell ourselves which transcend the boundaries of normal science. To quote Midgley, I have been struck for some time by certain remarkable prophetic and metaphysical passages that appeared suddenly in scientific books about evolution, often in their last chapters. Though these passages were detached from the official reasoning of the books, they still seemed to be presented as science but they made startling suggestions about vast themes, such as immortality, human destiny, and the meaning of life. Relating to evolution, Midgley is particularly critical of two popular trends, and we can call these trends what Midgley refers to as the escalator fallacy, which is the optimistic one, and what I'll call, I think she named it, but I forgot the name, uh, that she gave it in the book, I'll call it the meaningless spec argument, or the the rather pessimistic take, just sort of the, the, the flip side of the first one. The escalator fallacy, which was offered up in numerous forms by names as diverse as Herbert Spencer, the famous uh, 19th century thinker, um, Lamarck, the biologist, and Karl Marx, says something to the effect that so far evolution, evolution's highest and most profound achievement has been the human being, and that over time we will only grow in physical strength, intellect, creativity, awareness, etc. On the contrary, the idea of the meaningless spark espoused by uh, she mostly looks at Steven Weinberg, the famous theoretical astrophysicist in the book, holds that the more we know about the universe, the more pe the, the, the more pointless it actually seems to us. Uh, but that science provides one little piece, one little uh, soupçon of solace and consolation that, quote, these are Weinberg's words, lifts human life a little above 
the level of farce and gives it some of the grace of tragedy. Needless to say, uh, both... Uh, despite both these ideas being expressed by many well-known scientists, neither of these conclusions is exactly what you would call scientific. Um, uh, rather, they're very much mythical ideas about our place in the universe that, if we're not careful, become imbricated in the practice of science itself, and therefore actually seem to become equivalent in truth value to the claims of science. Midgley is also critical of the conclusions that scientists often draw uh, about life from a misguided understanding of evolutionary mechanics. For example, she rakes Richard Dawkins over the coals for coining the term selfish gene because she thinks it's silly to impute descriptors of human behavior to long chains of sugars, phosphates, and bases. Of course, it's not the selfishness of a gene that helps it to survive at all, she argues. And we all know, I think even Richard Dawkins knows this. In fact, I know he knows this. Um, it's not the selfishness of a gene that helps it survive, but rather that the gene creates an animal better suited to its environment and therefore much more likely to pass on that gene to consequent generations. However, when Dawkins imports the language of human intentionality into his discussion of genetics, Midgley thinks he's promoting the, quote, worship of competition, and that it's like projecting a Thatcherite take on economics onto evolution. It's not an impartial scientific view. It's a political drama. That's what she calls it, a political drama. Basically, what, what, what she's accusing him of doing is importing this dynamic of something that has nothing to do with genes or evolution at all to describe evolution. And, and with, that, with that comparison, with that metaphor, you're also importing a lot of other baggage that's not really necessary to understand the entire uh, mechanisms and uh, well, what is actually going on when we say that a certain organism evolves in the way that it does. Uh, and also, uh, in the first sentence, uh, a few sentences ago, I said that uh, Richard Dawkins was had a misguided understanding of evolution. Of course, I'm uh, I'm not suggesting that he actually has a misunderstanding of it. Needless to say, he's you know a, a giant in and, and contemporary uh, science and the, the public understanding of science. I respect and, and value uh, his work, not to mention his tireless efforts to popularize scientific ideas. But by using this adjective selfish, he is consciously choosing language, which makes it seem as if genes are thinking, breathing, cognizant things, which, of course, they aren't. Midgley ends her book in much the same way that the book she criticizes end, however, which is interesting, namely by concluding a far overreaching generalization from the relatively small body of examples that she has considered. Because of the stories that scientists overlay, on evolution. Uh, socio sociobiology, by the way, is also considered in the book, but I didn't really talk about it in the review. She says that science is not really a realm that values logic, reasoning, and deduction more than any other epistemic pursuit, and that science is just one more way of knowing, along with poetry and religion. And I'm sorry, but this simply will not do. As, as a conclusion to draw, whereas orthodox religion has constantly been shoved further and further into the corner in light of scientific and technological advances, sort of the god of the gaps, as we've seen over the past three or four hundred years with, sci with scientific advance, science continues to be the one self-correcting process. That's the important term here, self-correcting, that can render accurate, reliable information about the world. That is not to say that it, or even its most practiced and advanced practitioners, are without fault, uh, nor are they ever able, by definition, to escape the subjectivity of their own minds. 
but to go from noticing that some scientists occasionally graft and interweave conclusions that can be considered non-scientific into popular explanations of their work, to assuming that therefore there can be nothing that we can even begin to be, begin to be considered with a large degree of objectivity, is the very definition of the logical fallacy that we call poisoning the well. Because of the flawed nature of the logical, of logical induction and human error, science has made and will continue to make many mistakes. But here's the kicker that I want to reinforce and double down on. Science is self-correcting. Scientific ideas are never considered to be truths with a capital T, as the truths of religion are considered to be, or as the truth and beauty of, say, John Keats are. Scientific models are uh, that work are always provisional, and always are suggest uh, always are accepted with pro provisionality, and therefore always up for revision and sometimes complete and total overhaul if they fail, or become unable of explaining a particular phenomenon. Nothing remotely similar can be said uh, for the case of religion. Uh, or any other methods of exploring the universe around us. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with Mary Midgley or her work, uh, Midgley actually passed away last year, uh, on October 10th of 2018. She was 99 years old, and much of what she said angered and provoked the scientific establishment, and some of what she said um, may, maybe most is what I consider to be partially wrong or at least overstated. However, I think I've, I've never read anything by her that I didn't find at least a little glimmer of something thought-provoking in. She was the kind of person that I think the world needs more of, a provocateur that was never afraid to ask hard questions and occasionally throw the, uh, the, a grenade into a discussion. So, if you haven't, do yourself the honor and uh, pick up something by her. Whatever it is will almost surely challenge the way that you uh, see and think about the world. Uh, in the past, I, I wanted to mention another book on a completely different topic that I also read and reviewed, both on this channel and in Goodreads, and I will link the text to the Goodreads review, and if you care to listen to my review, which is just basically me reading the uh, Goodreads review, you can just search uh, Wickedness, which is the name of the book, on my channel, in my videos, and it should pop right up. So, um, if any of this sounds interesting to you, either the topic on of Wickedness, which, which by the way is the nature of human morality is basically what, what she talks about in that book. Um, it has its own problems, too. I gave that one four stars. I gave this one three. I think both have fascinating material in it, extraordinarily thought-provoking, interesting, even if I have my own quibbles with the conclusions. But, nevertheless, there you go. Evolution as a Religion by Mary Midgley. She'll be missed. Bye, guys. See you next week.